All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, happy Sunday afternoon. Hope you all made it to church. Um, if you didn't make it to church today, well, I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to guilt you. Um, there's definitely plenty of time to find something on YouTube, find something on Facebook. Everything is live streamed these days. So there's really not any excuse for not making it to church. But today, since how we're in October now, officially, I'm going to bring up something that is sure to be very controversial. And given the fact that some of my other videos don't have very many views, I don't know how many people are going to see this, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. Um, and the topic of this video is, should you, as a Christian, observe Halloween in any way, shape, or form? And that's through having a fall festival or a harvest festival at your church, um, dressing up in something less scary and demonic. Instead of dressing up as a witch, you dress up as a, you know, a Disney character or something like that. Should you, as a Christian, have anything to do with Halloween other than praying for the people that observe Halloween? And this is kind of an opinionated video. And my opinion is no. But we'll get into why. It's not just an opinion because it's Halloween, but it's an opinion based on facts and what Halloween actually represents. So as we get closer to Halloween, I start noticing a lot of posts on Facebook. And it seems as though every single church in the immediate area is having a trunk or treat or a fall festival or a harvest festival or something to that nature. And they're doing it on Halloween. And here's the problem that I have with that. In the past, on Halloween, you would dress up in some sort of a costume, right? Didn't matter what costume it was. And you would go door to door, with your old costume on, your mask on, with a bag or a bucket or something like that. And you would ask for candy. Now, granted, this seems fairly harmless and innocent as a kid. And as a kid, you, you don't really know the true meaning of Halloween. Um, so it, it, it is kind of innocent for you. Um, but your parents know the meaning of Halloween. And so I've seen all these posts on Facebook for trunk or treats, trick or treats, uh, fall festivals, harvest festivals. And these churches know the true meaning behind Halloween. And all we're doing is renaming the the day. We're not calling it Halloween anymore. We're not having a trunk or treat. We're having a harvest festival or a fall festival. All we did was rename it. We're doing the same things. We're still going out. We're still dressing up. We're still putting on costumes and we're still putting on masks. And we're dressing up and we're going out looking for candy. The only difference is is that we're doing this at a church. And so today, actually at church, my pastor, well, last week they announced that we were going to have the Harvest Fest. And my pastor today at church, he said, this is a Harvest Fest. We're not renaming Halloween. It's not a Christian Halloween um, because there's nothing Christian about Halloween. But what we're doing is we're taking it as an opportunity to spread the word of God. I'm going to have to argue that one with you pastor and everybody else that thinks that Halloween or that we can have a harvest fest or something like that on Halloween, we're just renaming it. We're doing the same things. Yes. Is our goal to meet people, to reach people and, and spread the word of God. Yes. But do it the day before we're doing it on Halloween and we're renaming it. We're doing the same exact things as we would normally have done or as people would have done on Halloween, go out and trick or treat. We're doing the same exact thing, but we're doing it at a church. And that does not make it better at all. So I go to the Calvary Chapel churches. And specifically, Calvary Chapel Estancia Valley, which is um, about 35, 40 miles east and south of Albuquerque in the eastern part of, of New Mexico. And... The Calvary Churches, for those of you who don't know, was founded by Pastor Chuck Smith. 
when he founded Calvary Church Association. And he had some very specific um, rules, if you will, if you wanted to be a Calvary Church. The way that you were going to teach and your theology, things of that nature, that's something else for a different day. But Pastor Chuck made a video and talked and preached about the um, the evil behind Halloween. And he is dead now. He died, I think it was last year or the year before. But he has passed away, and I would be willing to bet that he is rolling over in his grave right now watching all of these Calvary Chapel churches do some sort of a Halloween festival. No, I'm sorry, we're not going to call it Halloween a harvest or a fall festival on Halloween. That there's only actually one church that I know of, of all of the churches, of all of the Methodist and Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever churches it is, there's only one church that I know of that does not celebrate Halloween, and that is Calvary Chapel Dimming, because the pastor refuses to do anything on Halloween, even if it's an opportunity to bring people in, to minister because that has been brought up. Why don't we do like some trunk or treat, have a bounce house kind of a thing. And he said, no, because we are not doing anything to celebrate Halloween. We're not going to change the name. We refuse to change the name, which is what all of these churches have done. <clears throat> so we'll get into this a little bit. Um, I mean, we could probably make several hours worth of study out of this, but I'm going to be reading a lot off of a website called uh, www.worldhistory.org. And I'll post the link in the description so that everybody can go through and read it. Um, but it talks about Halloween. And this is probably the most descriptive non-Wikipedia um, page that I could find. And I don't need to reinvent the wheel. We'll just it, it says everything I want it to say. So I don't need to make it all up on my own. So... It talks about how Halloween can be traced back to a, a Celtic festival of, uh, what did they call it, Suwan? How was it pronounced? Yeah, Suwan. Spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. Pronounced Suwan. And they talk about how Christian root groups have... Uh, attempted to demonize and denigrate the observance of this holiday. And to which I would like to say it's not Christian groups, it's Catholic groups. So there's a distinction between Catholics and Christians. And Catholics believe that you can pray to dead people, Mary, and God will, or they will intercede for us and God will hear our prayers better if we pray to these dead people. But Catholics are the ones that believe that you can speak to the dead people. That is very much an anti-biblical claim. It very much goes against all of the Bible. So to get into this, Samhain, which is Halloween, which is All Hallows Eve, which is the day before, it's the eve of, it's a, a Celtic New Year's festival which means summer's end. And the festival marked the close of the harvest season and the coming of winter. So it was believed that the veil between the worlds of the living and the dead were the thinnest at this point. So the dead could return and they could walk where they had before. So you're dead, but this is where the veil is the thinnest and you can come back and continue to walk where you were, talk to people, whatever the case may be. So, those who had died in the past year, for one reason or another, had not moved on, would do so at this time. And they were able to interact with the living. Completely 100% anti-biblical. We'll get into some biblical stuff. We'll get into the scripture here in just a little bit. I kind of want to go through this first. So one of the things that this article says is, Very little is known of the rituals of ancient Samhain because the church Christianized it as with many pagan festivals, and what information is available comes from Irish monks who recorded the pre-Christian history of their people as well as other Christian scribes denigrating pagan rites. So I would like to say this. Um, 
the Christian church did not Christianize this at all. The Catholics maybe did, not the Christian church, because it is actually 100% a pagan festival. And don't blame it on Christians or the church just because there were poor historical records. That's a horrible excuse to say that you don't actually know where this came from, even though we're kind of going through where this came from. So it goes on to say, departed loved ones were expected and welcomed. And the practice of setting out favorite foods for the dead may have originated as early as 2000 years ago. Though it's unclear, but many other kinds of spirit, some with some, which never had human form could also appear. And this included elves, fairies, the wee folks, spy, sprites, dark energies, and they were just as likely to pay a visit as those one longed to see again. So, <laughs> The dead, let's just clear this up. If you're dead, you're dead. You aren't floating around in some cosmos in whatever, waiting to come around and see your loved ones again. You are just dead. And your spirit is either in heaven or hell. You're going to be judged by God. And you're either going to be in heaven or hell. You're just floating around, waiting to come around and talk to us. Second of all, this makes no sense. And that if these other spirits could come through this veil while we're participating in this, why are we welcoming that? Why would you want to be a part of something that welcomed the elves, the fairies, the wee folk, the sprites? I don't know what a sprite is. I'm going to have to look that one up. Uh, the dark energies. Why are you willing to welcome those just as much as you are willing to welcome the dead people? Well, first of all, the dead people are dead. So if you're communicating with a dead person... You're communicating with um, an evil spirit. It's not your loved one. It's an evil spirit. And that's all there is to it. But why are we opening the door? And furthermore, how come this has only been something that's been around for about 2,000 years and not for the entire eternity of time? We're just all of a sudden 2,000 years ago, we can, we can do this and, and things happen. That doesn't make any sense. I would definitely not be one that wanted to open the door to let in any kind of a dark energy because bad things happen when you let in dark energy. So let's continue on here. In this article, it says further, there's a very good chance that the spirit of a person one may have wronged would also make an appearance. In order to deceive the spirits, people darkened their faces with ashes from the bonfires, a practice later known as guising, and this developed into wearing masks. A living person would recognize the spirit of a loved one and could then reveal themselves, but otherwise remain safe from the unwanted attention of the darker forces. So we're wearing a mask. First of all, we're participating in an event that you could um, let dark energies in, and then we're wearing a mask to try to prevent them from recognizing us. Or you could just not participate in the event that would let the dark energies in. That seems a little bit more simple than trying to disguise yourself wearing a mask. And as we all know, masks are a, a big part of Halloween to disguise our identity. But why even allow that to be a thing? Like, we don't have to hide from the demons, from evil spirits, from dark forces, dark powers, if we don't let them in. Um, I skipped over quite a few uh, paragraphs in this. There's a whole lot of talk about a bunch of popes and the Catholic Church. Catholic Church and the Christian Church should not be um, associated as being the same because they're completely, absolutely, 100% different. Which is one of the problems that I have with a lot of this stuff is they say the Christian church and what they mean is the Catholics. But we'll continue on with the whole mass thing and then and to do so we'll talk about the jack-o'-lantern. And so I'm just going to read this straight off of the, the website. <clears throat> the jack-o'-lantern is associated with the Irish folk tale of Stingy Jack a clever drunk and con man who fooled the devil into banning him from hell, but because of his sinful life could not enter heaven. 
Um, well, it's definitely a folk tale because you're either going to heaven or hell. And Satan doesn't have a choice. He can't ban you from hell. If you ain't in heaven, you, you're going to hell. And that's just as simple as it gets. Anyway, it says after his death, he roamed the world carrying a small lantern made of a turnip with a red hot ember from hell inside to light his way. Scholars believe this legend evolved from sighting of will-o'-the-wisp swamp and marsh gra gases which glowed in the night. On All Hallows Eve, which is Halloween, the Irish followed up, hollowed out turnips and carved them with faces, placing a candle inside so that as they went about souling on the night when the veil between life and death was the thinnest, they would be protected from spirits like Stingy Jack. So we're using a jack-o'-lantern to ward off evil spirits. A turnip. Or in modern-day North America, we're using a pumpkin, carving it out with some kind of a face, which is not a happy face in most cases. Definitely most looks demonic and full of Satan. But we're carving that out and putting a candle inside so that we can be protected from evil spirits. Hmm. Sounds a whole lot like paganism. Because the only thing that we need to protect us from evil spirits is... The Holy Spirit is God. So it goes on to say um, that now after the arrival in the United States, we traded the turnip for the pumpkin because it was much easier to carve. But the truth of the matter is the reason for the pumpkin, the reason for the jack-o'-lantern was to ward off the evil spirits, was to scare away this stingy jack spirit that sounds kind of demonic and so as a christian what part of any of this would sound appealing would make you want to participate in this and as a church, why would you want to participate in anything that has to do with this sort of activity? Granted, I understand that as a church, you're not out there carving jack-o'-lanterns. And you're not trying to ward off evil spirits. But you're still participating in this day. The only thing that has changed is that it's happening at a church. And it's not going door to door. And I'll argue that the people that go to the church are still going to go out and go door to door. So you're not really stopping anything. Now, I know a lot of people argue it's a good chance to get to get people to um, follow the Lord, to convert people, to share the word of God, to share the gospel. But if people are out there celebrating this evil day, and grant that a lot of people might not know the evil history behind it, but if they're out there celebrating this evil day, how successful do you really think you're going to be in converting people? They're there for the fun. They're there because they're going to get free candy, and their kids are going to have fun. And to be honest, they could care less. Uh, about anything that has to do with God. I mean, I'm not saying don't pray for your church. If your church is holding um, a trunk or treat or a harvest fest or a fall fest and you don't want to be involved with it because it has to do with Halloween, I'm not saying don't pray for it. Pray that God's presence is there, but I, I'm not going to be involved in it. Not at my church. I refuse to go down and be involved in that. I'm going to pray for it because I want God watching over it. But I'm not going to be involved in it. 
And that doesn't mean that God won't do things. That God won't use evil and dark days, such as Halloween, to reach people. I just think it's kind of, it's hard to sit there and imagine that you want to sit there on a day where people worship Satan and the devil and try to reach them or try to reach them with God. Not that it can't happen. I mean, we should take every opportunity that we have to reach people with God. A couple of years ago, and I will put links to this video also in my uh, description. A couple of years ago, it's been, I want to say three years ago. I think it was in 2019. Um, Calvary Chapel Deming and, um, oh, what was the name of the other church? Living, Living Blessed Hope. Blessed Hope Fellowship in Dinning, two local churches, we showed a video from Pastor Glenn Berteau. Um, the video was called, Mom, Can I Be a Witch? And we showed it, I can't remember exactly now because it's been three years, but three or four times. I think it showed three times at the movie theater and then one time at our church. And it's a it's a sermon that says why you should not, as a Christian, participate in Halloween. And it actually has in it uh, testimonies from nurses and people that practice witchcraft that explain why Christians should have nothing to do with Halloween, if they're actually true Christians, because of how dark and how evil it is. And so we showed this movie at the movie theater, and there was, you know, a handful or dozen so families that showed up to watch it. And they all left, I know, in disappointment because they thought that they were going to see a Halloween movie. Nobody wanted to go see something about God, they wanted to go see something about Halloween and evil. They didn't want to go hear about how what they were doing was evil, about how God said it was evil. They wanted to watch a movie about evil. And when everybody left, we handed them flyers that, you know, gave um, addresses and service times for Blessed Hope Fellowship and Calvary Chapel Deming. And sadly, not one single person showed up to church. Not one. And it's because we would rather sit around and live in sin and worship things. Like we want to sit here and argue that God doesn't exist, but then we want to go and celebrate something that is satanic and demonic and full of sin. So if you're a Christian... I implore you to definitely reconsider how you're going to act and behave on Halloween. What you're going to participate in on Halloween. There's nothing Christian about Halloween and I don't care what you do to rename it. You're still doing the same thing. And we're not done yet. I still have some scriptures that I want to go through. So one of the first scriptures that I want to talk to, and the next few talk about sorcery and uh, mediums, so on and so forth, and how God feels about it. The first one is Exodus twenty-two eighteen: You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Well, that sounds pretty blatant. How does God feel about sorcerists? Leviticus 19, 31 says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And so in this one and the next couple of verses and the previous verse in Exodus all talk about how God feels about speaking to the dead. Do not use mediums, sorcerers, um, or anyone else to speak to the dead. The dead are dead. And that's kind of a lot of what Halloween is about, right? Where the veil... Between the living and dead is the the thinnest, 
and so the spirits can pass over. God strictly prohibits speaking to the dead or speaking to someone that can speak to the dead. So Leviticus 20 verses 6 says, And the soul that turneth after such as I as have familiar familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and I will cut him off from among his people. And then if we go down to hold on, we go down to verse 27. He says, A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with the stones. Their blood shall be upon them. If you watched any of my other videos, you know how I like to say to put things in context. And so we're going to take a couple of verses here out of Deuteronomy. Uh, we're going to take verses 10 through 12. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Very clear here. Where God says all, that's that's a very broad word, <laughs> anyone, all who do these things are an abomination. That means that it's an abomination for you to try to talk to the dead. If you're in the Catholic Church, you pray to Mary because you believe that she can intercede for you because she is the mother of God, of Jesus, not God of Jesus. She's the mother of Jesus, so if you pray to Mary, she will intercede for you and Jesus cannot deny her request because he loves her so much because it's his or she's his mother. The problem is, is that Mary's dead. And so you're praying to a dead person when you do that. And what does God call that right here? An abomination. First Chronicles 10, 13 so Saul died for his faith unfaithfulness. Sorry, let's start over. Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance, but he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he, being God, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So what does that say? <laughs> God is clearly saying here to consult with him about anything and everything, not to pray to someone else, not to ask a medium, not to try to contact the dead. It doesn't matter whether you think that the veil is the thinnest and you want to see your loved ones once more. Do not contact the dead. God killed Saul because of his unfaithfulness, because instead of trusting in God and asking God, he asked a medium and God killed him. So this verse, 1 Timothy 2.5, I think makes it very clear who the only mediator between God and man is. And it's not Mary. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. We don't need Mary to intercede for us, or any other dead person, for that matter. We don't need them to intercede for us, to speak to God. Some people will say and argue, and I know this because I've seen it argued on my Facebook page and TikTok and other things, that it's no different, that it, praying to Mary is no different than asking your friend to pray for you. To which I say, it's absolutely 100% different because your friend is still alive. Mary is dead. She cannot hear your prayers. And some people will say that's disrespectful because I actually had somebody tell me that you need to be more respectful to Mary. 
That's Jesus's mom. Mary is just a person, not to be put on a pedestal. She was a sinful person, a person born of sin into a sinful world of the flesh, just like the rest of us. She just happened to be ordained by God to give birth to Jesus. But that doesn't make her any less of a, a human being, a sinful human being. And that doesn't mean that she is worthy of praise or worship. She's not. Asking your living friend to pray for you is 100% different. Because we should pray for each other. We should lift each other up in prayer. But praying to a dead person does nothing. And it's against the Bible. There's one mediator between God and men, and that's Jesus Christ. It's not Mary. It's not your dead husband. It's not your dead wife. It's not your grandmother. It's not your best friend. It's Jesus Christ. If they're dead, they're dead. In fact, to drive this point home, Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. And he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. <clears throat> now it might seem that some of the scripture doesn't have anything to do with Halloween. Halloween is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. But what the Bible does tell us and strictly forbids us to do is to worship anyone than, other than God, to pray to the dead, to consult with mediums or sorcerers or anyone that claims to communicate with the dead. Those are an abomination, an abomination to God. And if we follow Halloween, if we celebrate Halloween, it doesn't matter what guise you put it under. We can put it under the Fall Fest. We can put it under Harvest Fest. We're still doing the same exact things. The only difference is we're renaming it and we're putting it at a church. It's the only difference. It does not make it any better so I know that you're not going to be able to change your pastor's mind or your church's mind in regards to Halloween and they're having a fall festival my pastor as I said earlier made it very clear that this is not a renaming he said it's not a renaming we're not changing it to Christian Halloween. We're calling it a fall, a fall festival, which I think is the same thing. We're renaming it, and we're trying to make it a Christian Halloween. However, as much as I don't agree with it, it's not a salvation issue. So all of this being said, and since it's not a salvation issue, do I think that you as a Christian should celebrate Halloween? No. I've given you all of the reasons why I think that you shouldn't celebrate Halloween. If you do, do it according to Philippians 127. And no matter what you do, let your actions reflect your redeemed life. Do not go out and act any differently just because it's Halloween than you would any normal day in your saved, redeemed life. If it's going to cause you to act differently, maybe you're going to participate in some sort of evil or satanic event, no matter how major or minor, or you decide that Halloween's the one day that you're going to watch horror movies, which all of them are satanic and demonic, remember to do everything that you do. So that your actions reflect a redeemed life. 
much as like when you go to work in Colossians, it says, do everything you do as if you're doing it to God for the glory of God. Continue doing it that way. So if you're a Christian, I again, I highly encourage you to consider, reconsider not participating in any way, shape, or form in Halloween. But if you're going to, do it like you would with your redeemed life and pray, 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 pray on it. Because that is a day, I think that that is a day that when you participate in those activities, you open the door to let Satan and the devil into your house, into your life, into your house. And you don't want that. So pray about it. Pray, pray, pray. And if you have any doubts about it, if there's something in your mind, something in your heart that says don't do it, then don't. No one's forcing you to do it. That's God telling you not to do it if you have any kind of a doubt. If you have that doubt, walk away and wash your hands from it. Continue to be in prayer. For all of these churches, because like I said, I only know of one church that's not participating in Halloween. And I think that's pretty sad. But it is what it is. And we still need to pray. It's not a salvation issue. You're not going to hell if you participate in Halloween or a fall festival or a harvest festival. I just think it's not the Christian thing to do. So. That's my rant on Halloween. It's an unpopular opinion, and there's going to be somebody that comes out and brings Easter or Christ, uh, Christmas into it. We're not talking about Christmas. We're not talking about Easter. I'm talking about Halloween right now. I'll get to the other ones here before too long. It's an unpopular opinion. Pray about things. Don't do anything without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And just be faithful to God. So, all of that being said, if you liked the video, or you didn't, doesn't matter, hit that subscribe button, like it, save it, follow us. I have uh, the new Thirst Addiction Ministry every Sundays. I just published um, this week's Lesson 4 a couple of hours ago. Should be out there right now. Uh, if you or somebody you know needs a Bible, get in the comments, send me an email, thesoberchristian22 at gmail.com. Um, I'll put all of this in the comments. If you need a Bible, someone you know needs a Bible, I'll send you a paper Bible free of charge. I'm working on the website, soberforchrist.com. It's down right now. I have taken it down just because I'm trying to do a few more things to make it a little bit uh, more presentable before it's live again. Um, and then it'll be there. You can send emails. Uh, you can find all the resources, find videos, find the actual um, lessons for New Thirst Addiction Ministry. You can find all that on there. Have resources for Blue Letter Bible, gotquestions.org, things like that on there. It's a great, it's going to be a great place for research, for just Bible study and for those struggling with addiction. Um, but until then, we'll see you next time. And everyone, please stay blessed and stay grounded in God. Don't let the world get to you. Just be grounded. Keep your nose in the word. Pray and be with God. Have a great afternoon.